Okay, let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, when we were sinners and when we were living without any hope, you came all the way from heaven to save us. And by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, now we have a hope of joining you in the eternal kingdom in heaven. So Lord, thank you so much for saving us and loving us. And you are guiding us all the time until we reach the heaven. And Lord, even though we suffer sometimes in this world, even during that time we know that it is your will that we will endure all this hardship and we will grow. And today we are here again to listen to your word so that we can grow as Christian, as your child. So help us to understand your will in our life and encourage us to do your will while we are waiting for Jesus to come again. So Lord, please be with us and help us and strengthen us. So until we finish, I commit the rest of time unto your mighty hand. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, let's turn to uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 24. Acts chapter 20, verse 24. Acts chapter 20, verse 24. Let's read it together. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy. And the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. As you know, Apostle Paul preached the gospel for more than 30 years and finally he was beheaded in Rome for the sake of the gospel. And he is the one who sacrificed his life to preach the gospel. I would say that his entire life was devoted to the preaching of the gospel. So let me think about, let's think about the gospel today. What is the gospel and, um, you know, how we should live as Christian for the gospel. In original Greek language, the gospel is euangelion, euangelion. And it is basically just uh, means good news. So you, suppose you have a battle in the, you know, you had a war and then when you have a victory. The messenger comes and declares that, oh, we have a victory. That, that is good news, right? That is euangelion. Euangelion, the Greek word, good news. And from that word, euangelion, we have the English word evangelize. Actually, evangelize, you know, preaching the gospel or evangelize, the same meaning. So the gospel, originally, it means the good news. I think it, is, um, it, it makes sense because uh, what Jesus has done is he got the victory over death. He got victory over sin. He got victory over Satan. Right? So this is good news because um, all the sinners are in chains um, because we, are, we were the slaves of sin and death before. So here, in Acts chapter 20, verse 24, um, actually, all the pastors and evangelists, when we were appointed as evangelists, we get this scripture on the frame. We, we receive it from the church. I have one in my house. So this shows that, um, you know, how much Apostle Paul sacrificed himself to preach the gospel. He says, none of these things move me. What are these things? In verse 23 at the end, chains and tribulation await me. He knew that when he goes to Rome, chains and tribulation await him. But he said, it doesn't matter. I don't care, right? None of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself. My life is not important. My life, my own life, is nothing compared to the gospel I'm preaching. That's what he says. So he says, 
Uh, he has a ministry which he received from the Lord Jesus. What is the ministry? To testify to the gospel of the grace of God. So let's think about this. If you really want to live a good Christian life, focus on one thing, the gospel. I believe the reason why God uses our church is because we are really focusing on the gospel and preaching the gospel all the time. When I was in America, there are many Korean churches and uh, their focus is not preaching the gospel, not our church, but other churches. Uh, you know, if you go to the, another country, it's not so easy to meet other Koreans, right? So they come to the church. Even the Buddhists, they come to the church. Why? For business, number one. You have a business, maybe you need the Korean customers, business. Secondly, you know, for the marriage of your children. <laughs> you want your children to marry another Korean, not American, right? And church is the best place to meet these nice uh, young people, right? So even the Buddhist, you know, these people who used to go to the temple in Korea, when they go to America, they come to the church for business and for their children's marriage. And that's why, you know, the churches is not so powerful. They grow, actually, but a lot of problems, right, as you see. Um, I know one, one uh, brother who used to, he, he is um, like an oriental doctor, like acupuncture and all this thing. And he got saved uh, through one of our seminars. But he was running his business and he used to go to one church with 1,500 members, big church, Korean church. And he couldn't come to our church because he knew that if he changes churches, then he would lose all his customers. So he just kept going to the old church, the church he used to go. And one day, he made a big mistake. Uh, because he was so happy with his salvation, he asked the pastor, Pastor, when did you get saved? Right? And then the pastor was furious. You asked me about my salvation? And he didn't know why the pastor was so angry. And then he made another mistake. He asked another elder, Elder, when did you get saved? I just got saved like one week ago or some, some, some time ago. And then the elder was also angry. And then he couldn't go to the church anymore. You know? So uh, he, he was joining our church. I said, what happened? And then he said that I asked the pastor and elder about their salvation. And then they really was, uh, they didn't like it, basically. Why this is happening? Because the gospel should be the, the focus of the church. Let me tell you. You know, last three weeks, I think the last four weeks in Suwon Church, we were having the, the Grand Bible Seminar online again, and then we had a seminar for youth group. And then last week we had a seminar for the sisters in, during the daytime. And this time, last week, uh, the daytime Bible seminar, I heard uh, almost like 80 people. Uh, the new people joined, and then like 50 people were listening uh, continually. Actually. So I was so happy, even though uh, we couldn't come to the church. Still, online, we can preach the gospel. There are people who have the heart to listen and whenever I hear some brother sisters saying that why in our church there are so many Bible seminars again and again and again, this is the reason, right? Why we are living in this world? For the sake of the gospel. This is the ministry we receive from our Lord. This is the ministry our Lord gave us to do until he comes again. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. Let's read it together. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. 
Still, in many churches, uh, baptism, they consider baptism as salvation, which is wrong, actually, right? Baptism is just a ceremony. Baptism is important. Baptism and the uh, Lord's Supper, these two are the ceremonies given uh, by our Lord Jesus Christ. We should practice it. But they are just ceremonies, right? So remember the criminal who died next to Jesus. Did he take a baptism? The criminal who died next to Jesus. He was hanging on the cross. So he couldn't take the baptism, but Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. So we know that he went to heaven, right? So baptism, you know, sometimes you cannot take it because of some reason, but it's okay. You know, it's just a ceremony showing that uh, I'm now born again by the blood of Jesus Christ. You are declaring your salvation to other people. In that sense, it's important. Because if you take a baptism, your Christian life goes better than those who didn't take. So it's important. But it's not salvation. So here, Apostle Paul is saying, For Christ did not send me to baptize. Baptism is important, but that's not the reason why I, I, uh, I'm, I'm uh, preaching the gospel, right? He says, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. So basically, Apostle Paul is saying, my whole life is dedicated to preaching the gospel. And believe me, you know, uh, I'm very glad that we are having this seminar again and again and again in our church. Even when we have a spring retreat, summer retreat, or fall retreat, every time we have a retreat, we are having the Bible seminar, actually, to preach the gospel, right? And some brothers and sisters saying that, oh, the same thing again and again and again. Yes, actually. That's okay. Because Jesus said, one soul is more valuable than the whole world. If one soul is saved through the seminar or through the retreat, it's worth it, right? And when we go to heaven, Jesus would say, well done, well done. So having Bible seminar again and again, I think that's the strength of our church. And during this uh, time, the difficult time with the corona, we still, we still, uh, preaching the gospel all the time. And that is the reason why we exist, right? Why we are living in this world. So what is the gospel? What is the gospel? Actually, um, there's a scripture summarizing what the gospel means. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 1 to 4. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 to 4. Let's read it together. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So Apostle Paul is saying in verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you receive and in which you stand. So he's explaining the gospel I preach to you. In verse 2, by which also you are saved. You are saved by the, this gospel, this good news, right? This good news. What is this good news? Verse 3, for I deliver to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins. Basically, this is the good news, right? Why people go to hell? Because of their sins. We cannot wash our sins with the soap or with our good work. Nothing works except the blood of Jesus Christ. This is the gospel message, right? Think about the cross. Cross. 
Apostle Paul always had this cross as the center of his ministry, cross. Do you see the cross where Jesus was hanging? The cross. What does cross mean to you? I was thinking about cross this morning, and then I was thinking that cross means the love, right? That shows that how much God loves us, right? The cross means that Jesus, he loves us so much that he said, I will die for you, right? I will take the, all the punishment and all this uh, guilt and all this penalty for your sins and I will die on the cross. So cross means love. And secondly, cross means obedience because Jesus, he didn't want to take the cup. So he was praying to Father, Father, if possible, right? He didn't want, want to take that cup, the cup of suffering, death, but not by my will, but by your will. And he obeyed, right? Cross means obedience, actually, obedience. And thirdly, cross means victory. Because when Jesus died on the cross and when he resurrected the third day, he crushed the head of Satan, right? He won the victory over death and sin. The cross is love, obedience, and victory. That's why you know, the cross should be the center of our Christian lives. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. Let's read it together. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. You want to be successful in your life? Then just focus on one thing, the cross, right? So this is what Apostle Paul said. I determined, I made a decision not to know anything. You know, he, he didn't care about you know, money or how big house he has or the reputation from the people or whatever, right? He didn't care about anything else but, but Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's why he was so effective. His ministry lasted for almost 30 years and you know how many churches he planted I think when we go to heaven, we have to thank Apostle Paul because of his sacrifice and his, uh, his hard work. The gospel came down to us, actually, right? And his secret of uh, successful Christian life is just focusing on him, Jesus, and him crucified. And that is why God used him. Now, many times we are distracted. These days, especially in Korea, for example, the Satan's tactic is distracting the Christians so that we, can, we cannot focus on Jesus only, right? We are distracted by many things. We have, to, we have to care about many other things than this cross, right? Sometimes we compare with uh, ourselves with others, like uh, other neighbors and or our friends or coworkers, and we see that how well you know they are doing. And then sometimes we pity ourselves, not thinking about the eternal blessing God promised. This is the uh, secret. Okay, we have to focus only on the cross, Jesus Christ, and Him crucified. So, regarding the gospel, regarding the gospel, we have to remember you know, what Jesus has done for us all the time. Do you know in, in Revelation? Revelation is revelation of Jesus Christ, right? What he is planning to do at the end of the world. And there, again and again, Jesus is described as the lamb, lamb, right? Let's turn to Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. Uh, 
Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. Let's read it together. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. This lamb is Jesus Christ. So when Apostle John went up to heaven, and he saw Jesus in the form of the lamb, not just lamb, as though it had been slain. I would say maybe there was a blood on this lamb. So in front of the throne, there was a lamb. Lamb. It looked like it was a slain. It was killed. And there was a eight, uh, seven eyes, right? Uh, seven horns and seven eyes. And these seven eyes represents the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, Holy Spirit watching the whole world. Why Jesus appears as the lamb, a slain lamb? Because this slain lamb, when you look at the lamb slain, you know, it reminds you of the cross, right? The lamb. Behold the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. And he was slain on the cross. So basically Jesus, he shows us what he has done for us. Even in the heaven, he appears as the lamb to emphasize you know, his sacrifice and his ministry for us. The gospel says, the gospel declares that because of this, the death and sacrifice of the lamb, that's why we can join him in heaven, right? So, the gospel. Uh, I will give you seven points what we have to remember about the gospel. Okay, seven points about the gospel today. Number one, of course, we have to declare the gospel to others, right? We have to declare the gospel. That is the, the main reason why we are living in this world. Do you remember the Cornelius, the Roman centurion, who was really good at helping others, but he was not saved when the angel appeared before Cornelius and said, send people to get Peter in Joppa. Why? When Peter came, he preached the gospel to Cornelius. And I was always wondering why angel didn't preach the gospel to Cornelius directly, right? Uh, if angel preached the gospel, like uh, explaining why, why Jesus came and what he has done, if angel says that, maybe it's uh, more believable, right? But God doesn't work that way, right? The gospel, saving soul, he is doing through us, a born again Christian. And Jesus showed a good example. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. Let's read it together. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. During his public life, we call Jesus' public life of uh, three and a half years, he was... Uh, training his disciples, of course, but one of the, his main job was preaching the gospel. He was going many places to preach the gospel. Mark chapter 1, verse 38. Mark chapter 1, verse 38. Mark chapter 1, verse 38. Let's read it together. But he said to them, let us go into Mark chapter 1, verse 38. Uh, but he said to them, Let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. Let's go to the next town and next town and next town. He was visiting so many places. Why? He said, That I may preach there also. 
When I was in India, in the beginning of my Indian ministry, I was visiting so many places. I was, one day I was counting how many days I'm staying at home and how many days I'm traveling, right? So in one year, I found that I was traveling nine months. In three months, I was staying at home because uh, uh, there was an invitation from many churches. Uh, so I was going here and there. I still remember one place. Uh, it was really, really countryside, right? Um, after having one session of the Bible seminar, I came to my place and then I was taking shower and the, the color of the water was kind of the milky color, like a white. And then I felt very scratch, right? Uh, itch. I was scratching a lot and I, th I thought there's a one, some problem with the water. And I was thinking that, okay, what kind of water they will use to cook? Because I was thinking, will I drink this water? <laughs> so next morning, I went out early to see how they cook, for example, rice, right? And I found that uh, they have some kind of, um, you know, when you buy oil, some big, Tin can is there, so in some container they put some like a, the um, not charcoal when you burn the wood. What what is it? I just forgot the word. After you burn the wood, right? The the leftover the black thing, right? And then they put the sand, and then they put basically they they made us some temp. Uh, temporary uh, water purifier. <laughs> and then they, they put the water, this milky one, and then somehow it became a little bit clearer, you know, after going through all this sand and all these things. And then they, they cook rice for me. And then I was thinking, should I eat or not? But you know that number one principle for missionary, eat whatever is given, okay? That's number one. You have to eat whatever they give you. If not, they feel bad, and then you cannot preach the gospel. So I prayed, you know, God, please help me, <laughs> because I don't want to be sick here. Uh, food is a big problem, right? Uh, when you go on a, another place, the, um, um, Korea is very hygienic, so you don't have to worry about the food, but many places is a big problem. Anyway, um, going to many places, I saw so many people, and then I still remember many places. And they were so eager to listen to the gospel, actually, right? Maybe Jesus, when he was going here and there, uh, of course he was tired, but one of the reasons why he visited many places is uh, people are there who are waiting for him to listen to the gospel message, right? So we have to go to the end of the world, actually. And that's why we are sending so many missionaries uh, I'm praying for our, one of the missionaries in Brazil these days because Brazil, the coronavirus is becoming so bad there, right? Uh, so there are many missionaries. We have to remember them and pray for them. So this is what Jesus did. Let's go into the next towns and that I may preach there also because for this purpose I have come forth. We call Jesus Lord and this is what he did always visiting here and there, preaching the gospel. And we, we know, you know Apostle Paul and all these apostles, they, they were always preaching the gospel. And most of them were martyred, killed, during, while they were preaching the gospel. And we have to think about ourselves, what we are doing. You know, right? We only care for our own family or you know, our own economic condition or our health. We have to focus on the gospel. Number two, um, these days, people, you know, they have so many false teachings and false news, and then even the, they, they came up with all these theories which is against the gospel, right? Uh, so we have to defend the gospel, defend. Let's turn to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians, 
Ephesians and Philippians, chapter 1. Um, verse 17. 17. Verse 17. Chapter 1, verse 17. Let's read it together. But the letter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. Defense of the gospel. That's what we, are, what we should do. When people mock you know, Jesus or Christianity, we have to defend it. You know, don't be silent. Right? Um, let's do 1 Peter. 1 Peter, chapter 3. Verse 15, 1 Peter, chapter 3, verse 15. Let's read it together. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, which with meekness and fear. Here again, the defense you should be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope, for your faith, basically. Right? Why you believe Jesus? You should be able to answer them. Right? Uh, the Bible seminar we are having is a great tool to defend the gospel, basically. I would say there are three areas we are emphasizing in our Bible seminar. Number one, science. Number two, history. Number three, prophecy. Science, history, prophecy, right? So we are presenting many evidences in these three areas. Science, history, prophecy. These are very powerful tools to defend the gospel. For me, uh, when I was attending the Bible seminar in 1989, the most shocking fact was uh, about Israel, right? The independence of Israel in 1948. When I visited Israel, I visited the museum where they declared the independence. You, you, you remember the picture, right? Uh, the small museum, they gathered and they declared independence. And then uh, from the next day, the war broke out between Israel and Arab countries. You know the story. But this is amazing, right? After so many years. So when I, what, I'm, what I mean is, uh, I believe we are all different. So when you are listening to the Bible seminar, some facts really uh, touch your heart. Wow, this is amazing. And you have to remember it and you have to share it with others because uh, something touching your heart will touch others, others' heart when you deliver it you know, sincerely, basically, right? So for me, I can say, think about it. You know, is there any nation in the world uh, after losing, you know, nation 2,000, like 600 years ago, and after being scattered all over the world 1,900 years ago, they came back and they started, you know, their nation again. That's a miracle. I can say that with, like, uh, power and enthusiasm because that's what I believe. So... We are to defend the gospel, defend, right? We have, to, we have to tell the people boldly, effectively, with the facts, so that maybe they might not believe you, but still they, they will get impression. Maybe there's something in the Bible. That's why he's saying with such a boldness or confidence, right? So we are to defend the gospel. Number three, we have to live our life worthy of the gospel. We are preaching the gospel with our life, not with our word, many times. Okay? Let's turn to Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Uh, in this scripture, verse 27, uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, there are two points. So the number one point is, uh, let me read, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Okay. Let your conduct, your life, 
be worthy of the gospel of Christ. We say we are children of God, but if our life doesn't reflect it, people do not listen to us. If you cheat others, if you lie, if you are not diligent, you know, if you are basically, if you are just like uh, unbelievers, whatever you say has no power. It's not effective, right? So let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. That's the first point. No. We should be the light and salt of this world. Light and salt. You know, these days people lie a lot, I found, right? Even the nations lie, and then we have to be careful because of uh, so many lies and fake news, and then people, they are very bold in lying these days, right? As Christians, sometimes if it means that we are losing something, if it causes some loss in, on our side, we should be honest, right? We should be... Uh, we should be a good example to other people, basically, right? People are cheating in their work. I know some people do not work over time, but they ask their friends to, to uh, punch in the time, and then they get extra money for this extra hour they didn't work. Anyway, all kinds of cheatings, and the students, when they take exams, you know, they cheat, right? And the, there's a Peer pressure, you know peer pressure? When everyone does that, if you don't do that, then people somehow, even though it's a very bad thing, right? There's a pressure, and then we shouldn't really succumb to that pressure, okay? In, and, and also, let me continue to read, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs. The rest of it, let's read it together that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the face of the gospel. So, not only your life should be worthy of the gospel, second point in this scripture is, we, we have to have the one spirit, one mind, striving together for the face of the gospel. We have to work together. We do not preach the gospel alone, actually. It's very difficult. It's not the will of God. The will of God is we should be together, working together, praying together to preach the gospel. And our senior pastor, he is always saying that, right? After being born again, Pastor Riohan says that after being born again, four years he wasted. Why? He didn't know this, this working together. He, he just tried to preach the gospel alone here and there with no result, basically, right? Four years. And then he realized that, he came to know that the will of God is we Christians are together, we work together. And these days, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm talking about this Bible reading these days, right? Uh, the Swan Church, the sisters are trying to finish the whole Bible uh, until I think April 15th. Anyway, I heard that there are more than 130, I think 137 sisters already finished reading the whole Bible in three months. 137 sisters. Uh, we already bought uh, 200 Bibles to give as a gift. It, it costs a lot of money, basically, right? 200 Bibles we bought, and then our senior pastor will sign the Bible. <laughs> Congratulations on completion of the reading the whole Bible uh, during this difficult time. That's what we are planning. But when I was uh, hearing these stories, I came to know that you know, alone, we cannot read the Bible that much, basically. But because we are reading together, you know, the sisters are asking other sisters, how, how, how many chapters are you reading every day? They say, oh, only 20 chapters. Like the 20 chapters? Okay, I have to read more. Like that, you know? They talk to each other, and then when we are together, do you know the birds flying very far distance, they make a V shape, right? And then the, the first one always struggles because uh, uh, there's a resistance from the air, right? 
and then the other birds making sound to encourage the first one all the time. That's how they fly the long distance, right? So we are encouraging each other and then we are working together. That's the will of God. So even the preaching the gospel, you know, we have to work together. One spirit, one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. That's what we are doing until Jesus comes. And number four, that's why, that's why this fellowship is important. Fellowship. Okay? I believe the reason why God blessed our church is because uh, we are focused, emphasizing this fellowship a lot. Let me tell you one thing. Because of Corona, many churches are shut down these days. They are closing. And one of the reasons is this. You know, when they cannot come to the church, they are having this online service. Service is okay, but the online, um, like a fellowship, right? In our church, our fellowship is very intimate. Intimate means we are, we are sharing everything, basically, right? And then there's one sister who used to go to another church, but he got, she got saved and she joined our fellowship and she was so surprised. She said to me, Pastor, I never seen people sharing. They open their heart and then they sharing everything. The church I was going before, we never do that because if you share something like, a, you know, there's something you don't want to share, right? Something shameful. And if you share something like that, people uh, will, there will be rumors about you and then you'll be in big trouble, basically, right? Whenever we have this fellowship for sisters or for the cell group, for me, I struggle to finish on, in time because they want to talk more and more. You know, we start 10 a.m., the sisters' fellowship. We are supposed to finish by noon, 12, because that's my lunch time. <laughs> but they keep going, <laughs> 12, 30, and they keep Keep talking, and then one day I realized, wow, this is, the, um, this is the strength of our church, sharing everything and praying for each other. We are very close to each other. Philippians chapter 1, verse 3 to 5. Uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 3 to 5. Let's read it together. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Apostle Paul is thanking God for this Philippian church because they were fellowshipping, fellowshipping in the gospel from the first day. This is important. Not just fellowship, fellowshipping in the gospel. No, because the gospel, the fellowship is not just uh, gossiping. Right? We, are, we don't gossip about others. When we share our uh, testimony, it's about how to, how to preach gospel to our family members. We, we, we make a prayer request. You know, mainly it's about the gospel. Just like the, this Philippian church, they were fellowshipping in the gospel. So, we have to fellowship in the gospel. That's the will of God, right? And in the uh, Jerusalem church, the Jerusalem church, they met every day. You know that? Right? Every day they had a fellowship and they were listening to the preaching of the apostles. Listen to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Verse 46, 47. Acts chapter 2, verses 46 and 47. Let's read it together. So, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. 
Yes, they continued daily with one accord, with one heart. What, what they continue? Fellowshipping, right? They broke bread, meaning they shared the food. They're visiting house to house. Always, you know, gathering together. And what's the result? Verse 47, the end of the 47. And the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. Every day. Some people get saved. Every day. So this is why we have to fellowship in the gospel. And this is true, actually. When we Christians gather together, naturally we talk about the gospel, right? How to preach the gospel. Right? And uh, that's why we have to gather more often to fellowship in Christ. And also, regarding the gospel, we have to suffer for the gospel. Okay? Suffer. Let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 8. 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 8. Let's read it together. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to to the power of God. Underline the word sufferings for the gospel. Sufferings for the gospel. Why? You know, Jesus died for the gospel. Apostle Paul died for the gospel. Gospel is not preached without suffering, basically. So if you do not want to suffer, there will be no fruit in your Christian life. Chapter 2 Verse 9, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9. Let me read. For which, for which means for the gospel. In verse 8, according to my gospel, right? Verse 9, for which, for the gospel, I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains. But the word of God is not chained. So this time, do you know that 2 Timothy was the last, last book Apostle Paul wrote? And after the second Timothy, he died. He was beheaded, right? So he's saying that for the gospel, I suffer trouble as an evildoer. He's not an evildoer, but he's being treated like an evildoer. Now he's in the prison, in chains, to the point of chains. Why? Why Apostle Paul saved so many people in his ministry? He was not afraid of suffering for the gospel. Suffering. Um, we have so many countries uh, with our missionaries, but even for pastors and evangelists, they pray a lot before they go to some poor countries because, um, you know, when you think about your family, it's not an easy decision to go to these poor countries, right? You have children. Uh, you have children, and then they might be sick, and then the, you know, the health system there might not be good, the school system, and the children suffer, and the wife of a missionary suffer a lot, actually, right? So this is the main challenge for even for pastors and evangelists when they think about, you know, going as a missionary, right? The suffering. Not just a pastor or evangelist himself, but the family. The whole family will suffer, right? But we know also, without suffering, there will be no result, right? 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2. Let's read it together. But even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at 
pi. As you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. They suffered a lot in Philippi. They suffered and they were spitefully treated. Means that people mocked them and people were like you know, beating them and then they were treated badly. But still, still we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. This conflict means you know, they were suffering so much conflict. So let's remember. The gospel is preached while we suffer. Okay? So if you, if you feel that why uh, nobody is being saved through me, if you think that way, you have to ask yourself, am I ready to suffer for the gospel? Or I'm just seeking my own comfort or my own, you know, my, my own benefit in my life. So gospel means suffering. And we shouldn't be ashamed of the gospel. Do you know that in the last days, people will mock Christians because we are talking about the second coming of Jesus. They say that, you know, are you joking? You think that Jesus will come again and then will take all the Christians up to heaven? And they are mocking us. First, uh, second Peter Chapter 3, 2 Peter, chapter 3, verse 3 and 4. 2 Peter, chapter 3, verse 3 and 4. Let's read it together. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. People say, where was the Noah's flood? The earth was just the same like that. You know, where is the promise of his coming? You believe people will disappear when Jesus comes and they are mocking, right? And some Christians become so ashamed of the gospel, but Apostle Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. You know why Apostle Paul was not ashamed of the gospel? Uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Let's read it together. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Gospel is the power. Gospel saves people. The gospel changes the lives of people. I saw this so many times. I saw people's lives change because of the gospel, right? The broken family becomes united again, right? The broken life is healed, right? And people now have the purpose, comfort, peace. The gospel has the power. If the Holy Spirit really works in us, we'll see that power, okay? Let's turn to 1 Thessalonians, chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 1, verse 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. Let's read it together. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. So here, Apostle Paul is saying, our gospel did not come to you in word only. The gospel is not knowledge. The gospel is not just a theory. The gospel has what? Power, right? It came in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. It has power, 
the Holy Spirit is real. The Holy Spirit is working in our heart, giving us joy, giving us uh, you know, strength and power. The Holy Spirit gives us uh, wisdom, encouragement, comfort, right? And in much assurance. Thessalonian church, they were persecuted. People were dying for the name of Jesus Christ. Do you know in Japan, when the gospel was preached in Japan, in the beginning it was okay, but later there was a persecution. And then, you know the story that to distinguish who is a Christian or not, they put the picture of the cross on the street and the, the government officers, they let people just you know, walk on the cross, just stepping on the cross, trampling on the cross. And the Christian couldn't do that because uh, they thought that it's like uh, putting Jesus to shame, right? When you are, you know, stepping on the cross and they just walk away, right? So they were walking around the cross, the picture, basically. And then they, they, they take them and then kill them, basically, right? Of course, even if we, you know, just trample on the cross, it's not a sin, but... In their heart, they couldn't do that, right? I read die, right? To put then to put my Lord Jesus to shame. That's why they were ready to die for the cross, right? So the gospel in its real power, you know, it changes people. So these Thessalonian brethren, they were ready to die for for the Lord, and they were waiting for the second coming of Jesus, right? That's why uh, First Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, when you read it, there's many stories about the second coming of Jesus because of their condition. They're waiting for Jesus to come again because that was their comfort. So the gospel changed them, and that news spread whole world. That's why, that's why Apostle Paul was very proud. Verse 8. Verse 8, uh, verse 7 and 8, let me read. So that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. For from you, the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. Their story, you know, their faith was spread. You know, people were talking about the faith of this Thessalonian church, and it encouraged so many people in Macedonia and Achaia and the whole world, right? The gospel has power. So let's remember, the gospel is everything in our life, especially for Apostle Paul, right? That's how he was so successful in his Christian life. First Corinthians chapter 9. First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 23. First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 23. Let's read it together. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partakers of it with you. He's doing many things for gospel's sake. Verse 22, let me read. Verse 22, to the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have became all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. To save some souls, to the unbelievers, he became like an unbeliever. To the Jews, he became like a Jew. Because if, if, even though... He was a Jew. He knew that he is not under the law anymore, but he kept the law not to offend the Jews, right? So he did everything he could do to save at least some people, right? And then verse 24, Do you not know that those who run uh, in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. 
Verse 26 and 27, let's read it together. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. When he runs, he has a clear goal, the gospel. When he fights, Right? He doesn't beat the air. He's beating the right place for the gospel. He has one clear purpose in his life, preaching the gospel. Verse 27, But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. My body, my flesh has desire. My flesh, you know, it keeps saying that, do this for me, do that for me. I want to eat something. I want to take a rest. I want to go somewhere. I want to enjoy this and that. But he says, I discipline my body. Discipline my body and bring it into subjection. So that, you know, he wants to preach to others. Because he's just focusing on the gospel. And he didn't want to be disqualified. This this. Qualification doesn't mean that he is going to hell. It means that his ministry will not be so effective if he's not focusing on the gospel, right? So let's remember, we are living for the gospel. When Jesus comes again, we will stand before him. And if you sacrifice everything for the gospel, then that time you will see, you know, you have fulfilled your life very nicely. Right? Because the gospel is worthy of your whole life. Oh, you can sacrifice everything for the sake of the gospel, just like uh, Apostle Paul. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we heard the gospel, the good news from the scripture before when we got saved. We learned that Jesus came to die for us. He shed all of his blood on the cross, saying, it is finished. And now we know our Lord wants us to preach the gospel to all the world, because there are so many people perishing without knowing this good news. So Lord, please change our heart, change our life, so that we can live a life worthy of the gospel. And we can strive together, work together with one mind, one heart, with one spirit to preach the gospel all over the world. Thank you so much for using our church to bring the gospel to many places in the world. And we need more missionaries and we need to work harder to preach the gospel to more people. So Lord, please help us to focus on the gospel in our life so that we do not waste our time in this world. Thank you so much for this time. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.